The Tudor period lasted 118 years and came directly after the infamous Wars of the Roses. The decisive battle was fought at Bosworth between the Yorkist King Richard III and Henry Tudor, the nephew of the Lancastrian King Henry VI. Although Henry was victorious and crowned king immediately after the battle in 1485, his link to the throne was tenuous. To strengthen his claim, he married Elizabeth of York, niece of King Richard III and daughter of Richard's older brother, King Edward IV. As king, Henry VII symbolically created the Tudor Rose, a combination of the Red Rose of Lancaster and the White Rose of York. The Tudor Rose symbolized peace and unity for England. However, not everyone felt as unified as Henry had hoped, and the Tudor period was far from peaceful. To find out more, Join us as we count down the five worst rebellions under the Tudor regime. Number 5. Ketz Rebellion, 1549 While many rebellions were instigated by nobles looking to redistribute power, Ketz Rebellion was started by a farmer in Norfolk called Robert Ket. While Ket was not the sole instigator of the rebellion, he agreed to lead a group of protesters who were increasingly infuriated by the enclosure of common land. At the time, poor people had the right to graze cattle and sheep on certain parcels of land. These areas were called commons, and the people who used them were referred to as commoners. However, during the 1540s, local landowners were fencing off common land, meaning local villagers no longer had anywhere to graze their livestock. Ket himself was not a commoner, but an upper-class middle farmer who had enclosed some of the common land for his own purposes. When the locals made him aware of the devastating effects enclosing common land had on the poorer population, Ket helped them tear down the fences and hedges he had erected. Then he joined their cause. The locals did not think of themselves as rebels, as the Lord Protector for the young King Edward VI, Edward Seymour, the first Duke of Somerset, had set up a commission to investigate the issues surrounding illegal enclosures. Feeling they had the government's support, Ket marched the protesters from Norfolk to Norwich picking up more supporters along the way. By the time they reached Mousehold Heath, there were around 16,000 people in the camp. They drew up a list of demands and grievances and sent them to Protector Somerset, who they believed would be sympathetic to their cause. However, the King's Council answered by declaring the protesters rebels and offering them a pardon. Ket's rebels rejected the pardon and attacked Norwich, soon taking the city. Once inside, they established their own government, and began hearing cases brought by commoners against landowners. Any landowner that was deemed to have acted illegally was imprisoned. The first force sent to take Norwich back from the rebels was unsuccessful, so John Dudley, Earl of Warwick, was sent with a larger army, including 1,000 mercenaries. Warwick's troops cut off the rebels' supply lines, forcing them into the Valley of Dusendale, where a bloody battle took place. Although there were heavy losses on both sides, Warwick was victorious and the rebellion was over. Enclosure continued to be an issue in England, as evidenced in this 17th century protest song. The law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common, but leaves the greater villain loose who steals the common off the goose. Even in England today, people are fighting to keep their right to roam, an ancient custom allowing people to walk in the open countryside. Number 4. The Northern Revolt, 1569 when Queen Elizabeth I came to power in 1558, she inherited a throne that came with some serious religious issues. As a Protestant, Elizabeth was unpopular with the Catholic lords in the north, but it wasn't just her religion that upset the northern earls. On ascending to the throne, Elizabeth tried to inhibit the northern earls' power by appointing some of their lands to southern lords. In 1568, Elizabeth's Catholic cousin, Mary Queen of Scots, escaped her prison in Lochleven. Believing that Elizabeth would support her, Mary traveled to England to meet with the Queen. However, Elizabeth imprisoned Mary out of fear that she would be used in a Catholic uprising. Mary's imprisonment angered the Northern Earls, and they decided to rebel and march to London to free Mary and depose Elizabeth. In 1569, the 6th Earl of Westmoreland, Charles Neville, and the 7th Earl of Northumberland, Thomas Percy, gathered a force of 4,500 men and rode to Durham. There, they stormed the cathedral, destroying the Protestant communion table and the English Bible before holding a Catholic Mass. Despite this early success, the earls did not really have a plan. In contrast, Elizabeth was a shrewd and decisive ruler. 
On hearing the news, she sent thousands of troops, led by the Earl of Sussex, to meet the rebellion head-on. When they discovered Sussex's forces were en route, many rebels fled. Those that were captured were severely punished, and over 600 were executed. The Earls fled, and their lands were confiscated, ultimately destroying the power of the Northern Earls for good. Number 3. The Pilgrimage of Grace, 1536 the Pilgrimage of Grace was the worst uprising under Henry VIII and was both political and religious in nature. The dissolution of monasteries triggered the revolt. When commissioners arrived in Lincolnshire to dissolve the small monasteries and collect a financial subsidy, they were attacked when riots broke out on October 1, 1536. By October 19, this movement had run out of steam, but in Yorkshire, an uprising led by Robert Ask started to gain momentum. Ask, supported by roughly 9,000 armed men and several magnates, took York. He was soon joined by more men. The rebels demanded the end of the dissolution, a return to papal obedience, and a parliament independent from the king. The rebels began to march south to try and get the king's attention, as Ask believed that it was King Henry's chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, who was the real instigator of the increasingly unpopular policies. Thomas Howard, the third Duke of Norfolk, met the advancing army at Doncaster Bridge. He had a much smaller force at his command than the rebels, so he used his powers of negotiation to placate them until more troops could be assembled. After hearing the rebels' demands, he offered them a full pardon and alluded that the king would honor their pleas. Ask, feeling that victory was in his grasp, told his followers to disperse. However, Howard had not made any concrete promises, and the bluff paid off. The rebels were no longer a united force, and the government could deal with the smaller, sporadic rioting that followed in early 1537. Ask was arrested and executed along with around 235 men, and the uprising was over. Number 2. Wyatt's Rebellion, 1554 In 1553, Henry VIII's daughter Mary came to power. Mary I was a staunch Catholic and the first queen to rule England in her own right. She was determined to return England to Catholicism and wanted to secure a Catholic heir to the English throne. To do this, she arranged to marry Philip II of Spain. Parliament and several members of the Queen's Council were averse to this match, not only because they wanted England to remain free from papal control, but because they felt that having a Habsburg on the throne would undermine England's position as an independent political power. As a contender for Mary's hand, her council proposed Edward Courtney, the first Earl of Devon. When it became clear that Mary would not be dissuaded from marrying Philip, several men decided that a military coup would be the only way to prevent the Union. The conspirators formed a rebel group, which included Sir Thomas Wyatt and the father of the executed nine-day queen, Lady Jane Grey. They formulated a plan to initiate an uprising on Palm Sunday and would each raise a different area of the country simultaneously to overwhelm Mary's forces. However, the insurgents disagreed on some elements of the uprising. Some felt Mary should be assassinated, while others felt she only needed to be deposed. However, the one thing they all agreed on was that she should be replaced by her Protestant half-sister Elizabeth, who would wed Courtney. But before everything was in place, Courtney, who had been treated well by Queen Mary, confessed the plot to the Bishop of Winchester in 1553. This admission, coupled with the Privy Council's suspicions, forced the rebels into action early. At first, it seemed they would be victorious, and the first forces sent to quash the rebels mutinied and joined them. Wyatt marched to London and arrived at the capital on February 3, 1554. Mary was able to rouse her troops with a stirring speech and lured Wyatt into a trap by letting him approach unchallenged, fooling Wyatt into believing that Mary's men were not as loyal to her as she thought. By the time Wyatt realized what was happening, Mary's forces had surrounded him and his men. He was arrested, imprisoned in the Tower of London, and executed on April 11, 1554. While the rebellion was a failure, it did cement Mary's reputation in the history books. The plot unnerved her, and although everyone involved was adamant that Elizabeth had been unaware of the rebels' plans, Mary imprisoned her anyway in the Tower of London. Mary went on to marry Philip and wreaked sadistic revenge on the rebels. Wyatt's dismembered head was placed on a gibbet at St. James, and others soon joined his. Mary also reintroduced the crime of heresy, burning around 300 so-called heretics. Her actions following the rebellion earned her the title of Bloody Mary. 
She was hated by the majority of her subjects and died just four years after Wyatt's failed rebellion. Number 1. Tyrone's Rebellion, 1595-1603 Tyrone's Rebellion, also referred to as the Nine Years' War, was an Irish uprising against Tudor rule. English rule in Ireland was, and still is, a point of contention for many. In the 1590s, England was under economic strain, as much of its finances were wrapped up in fighting the Spanish. This conflict forced the current ruler, Queen Elizabeth, to move troops from Ireland, leaving only small garrisons. The third Earl of Tyrone, Hugh O'Neill, wanted to break from the Tudor regime and govern Ulster himself. Seeing the lack of English troops in Ireland as an opportunity to act, Tyrone initiated a full-scale rebellion in 1595, having already been in touch with the Spanish for support. He was declared a traitor by Elizabeth's government, and other Irish clans took advantage of the situation to lead their own attacks against the English. Tyrone was able to evade capture, and the Irish won the Battle of the Yellow Ford in 1598. The defeat at Yellow Ford shook Elizabeth, who lost many men in the conflict. 300 of her men even deserted to join Tyrone. Elizabeth was forced to raise a large army to send to Ireland, which she could not afford at the time. The Earl of Essex headed the army, and his incompetence led to a peace agreement when the funds ran low. Tyrone had still not been captured. The base for English rule in Ireland, called the Pale, suffered from 80% inflation to pay for the army, which resulted in a near famine in the area. England's view of Ireland during this time is summed up by the phrase, beyond the Pale as the Elizabethans viewed the English part of Ireland to be the only civilized part, and anything beyond that was barbaric. Essex was soon replaced by the 8th Baron Mountjoy, Charles Blount. Blount was a much more competent commander and repelled Tyrone's reinforcements that came in the form of 3,500 Spanish troops landing at Kinsale in 1601. Tyrone was forced to surrender two years later, and Ulster remained under English rule. However, Tyrone was allowed to continue to rule Ulster without paying taxes to the English crown. As you can see, life under the Tudors was far from the peaceful time it was meant to be. Rebellions sprang up and were quashed throughout the period, with some of the most interesting English history arising from them. Which rebellion do you think had the most impact on England's history? Let us know in the comments below. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history? Impress your friends? and predict the future more accurately based on past events. If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about the Tudors, check out our book, The Tudors, A Captivating Guide to the History of England from Henry VII to Elizabeth I. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. If you found the video captivating, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.